Dr. Charlie Lineweaver from ANU, whose um, interest is, in, I suppose it would be generally described as astrobiology, but um, um, habitability of exoplanets and um, how certain life forms came about and whether they are likely to happen in other places or similar, similar life forms. So thanks very much for coming along, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I should also say that this is a, this is one of the, this is a WMAP map, but uh, this is the map of the microwave background fluctuations that we discovered in 1992 with the differential microwave radiometer. That's what I did my PhD in. So if you have any questions about cosmology, uh, uh, go right ahead and ask them. All right. So habitability of planets, galaxies, and universes. So the idea is habitability, and uh, this room is habitable, and that's why you and I are here. But let's. Uh, we talked about this, I'm not sure, I guess some half of you were in the other uh, talk I gave the other night, but anyway, what is life? It's not obvious what life is, and I, that's the point I want to try to make. It's hard, and it's maybe even impossible, to talk about habitability unless we know what life is. And uh, I'm not quite sure we know what life is. So is life just whatever biologists study, for example? Biologists study it, therefore it's life. Or, or I've done a survey, of, I've gone around the world and surveyed biologists, are viruses alive? About a quarter say no, about a quarter say yes, a quarter say I don't know, and a quarter say it's not an important question. So the existences of viruses, these are the most abundant organisms in the, on Earth. They outnumber bacteria by about a factor of 10. The existence of viruses is good, is good evidence that there is no well-defined boundary between life and non-life. So keep that in mind whenever you think there's life and there's non-life. That black and white dichotomy that's so easy to think about as yes and no, that's completely wrong when you talk about a continuum. And this, right in the middle of this continuum, you could think of viruses. Okay, how, how about the size thing? How big or small can life be? Here's another thing. Well, is Gaia, some people think that Gaia is alive. This is James Lovelock's idea that the whole biosphere can be thought of as a living organism. Or how about an ecosystem? I'm having a little trouble with this here. <laughs> okay, oops. Come on, get over there, cursor. Hello, cursor. There, there it is, okay. So I'm trying to, hello. <laughs> Maybe if I go like this. Okay, so an ecosystem. Is a city alive? How about the multicellular organism? You are made out of about 50 trillion cells. They're all, or, uh, they're all coordinated. But they're, we used to be unicellular organisms, and then there are viruses being exchanged between the bacteria, and then there's things called viroids, and they're genes, and they're prions, and they're jumping genes. There are all kinds of things inside of you that you could call alive. But uh, I guess the idea is that life, as usually understood, disappears as we go to either end of this size range. And that's interesting, that we have defined something that we don't usually associate with a specific size, but it obviously has a size because as we go up we're uncomfortable, we go down we're uncomfortable. So in the, in the size range of what we could recognize as life, we are in the middle. How objective can that be? So there's also something about habitability. There are two parts to habitability. One is, this is, is, the, is the region you're talking about suitable for the origin of life? So no sense talking about habitability unless you can have the origination, the origin of life. And then there's the suitability to support life. Usually we just think of this support life, but if you're going to be interested in an environment, you know, it's not going to be that important if life has not originated there. What's the sense of talking about a habitable environment if it wasn't a place where life could evolve and emerge? things that are important for the origin of life. Now, we don't know much about the origin of life, uh, but maybe you need a planet or a moon. Maybe you need to have the surface or a hydrothermal vent. You need some type of chemical disequilibrium and redox reactions, autocatalytic cycles, hydration, dehydration. Maybe you need UV photons. See these UV photons here? What is going on? Okay. UV photons. Hello? Over there. UV photons. Um, maybe you need even large impacts. Maybe in the first half a billion years or so, when we know there was a large impact on Earth and in any planetary system that's forming, the first 500 million years, there's really a free-for-all of bodies accreting and boom, boom, very big impacts. Maybe that's some type of source of energy for getting life started. And then there are lipids and amino acids and liquid solvents. We need maybe H2O, maybe CO2, or maybe methane. Uh, now, what about suitability for support life? 
Well, you have source of free energy, water, you maybe you need a star, no giant impacts. Maybe you don't, can't have too many giant impacts. Remember, our moon was probably formed by the, an object that was maybe as big as Mars and bam, smashed into the Earth, created a whole bunch of debris that debris accreted into the moon. Uh, and maybe you don't want nearby supernova right here. Okay. Now, in the origin of life, here's Stanley Miller, who in 1953 found, hey, I can make life in a test tube. What he was making was amino acids. And then you put them together into polypeptides and protonoids, lipids, carbonaceous chondrites. These are all the things that people who are interested in the study of the origin of life have to play with in their laboratories trying to figure out uh, if they can make life, synthetic life. So far, no takers, but uh, that's what's going on. Uh, one thing that's missing from a synthetic life is time and natural selection. The other thing is suitable to supportive life. Well, there you're just having something like an ecosphere. Here's a biosphere. You have some little animals in here. You have some plants. So the animals are breathing oxygen. The plants are producing oxygen. And you have some nutrients going around in the cycle. So NASA is very interested in this type of thing because we would like to not only go to Mars, we'd like to go to Venus and Mercury and uh, Jupiter and Europa and Titan and eventually with human beings. And to do that, you have to have some type of giant version of this, which has nutrient cycles that go around and you can control it. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a place in uh, Arizona called Biosphere 2 where they're trying to do this on a much bigger scale on the Earth. Uh, but anyway, that's just for the suitable to support the life. Notice they're not even considering uh, the origin of life. They're just putting in life to make a, uh, the, the smallest possible ecosystem that things go round and round in. I should say, since we have a small group here, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or call out and I will try my best to answer. Any questions so far on what I've said? Hmm. Continue. All right, so here's a one slide. Now, since I'm a cosmobiologist, I can do this. Here is uh, the Big Bang, produced hydrogen and helium. And then they produced these first generation of stars, which were mostly made out of hydrogen and helium. Then the big ones, blah, boom, after 5, 10, 50 million years. The little red ones don't go boom until maybe the about 100 billion years, so 10 times the age of the universe or so. Here's the sun, sun stars like this, they live about 10 billion years. But then with these elements from these big blue ones, you produce oxygen, you produce carbon, nitrogen, and iron, and then you can produce something like this, a rocky planet. Now somehow, life gets started right there, and then we can, if you're a good biologist, you can create this tree of life. That's what these branches are. We can use genetics, and genetic sequencing has just exploded, really. And uh, thousands and thousands of species, maybe every day there are 10 more, in which some biologist has taken the DNA, sequenced it, and then put it on this tree so we know what's the closest relative, what's the next closest relative, what's the next closest relative, creating a whole tree of life and the problem is that it's easy to do the ones that are up here, and as you get deeper and deeper, it's harder to know how this got started. So that's the origin issue. All right, so are there specific places and times on Earth or in our solar system, on planets orbiting other stars, in our galaxy or other galaxies, or even in other universes, where we are more likely to find life? That's the question I'd like to address here. And as you can see up here in the upper left, we have the Earth, and there are different regions of habitability that I'll talk about. Then we have planetary systems. This is our planetary system, but there are many, many others. Then in the galaxy, where, where's the best place in the galaxy to be if you want to have life? And then maybe what's the best kind of universe to live in if you want to, uh, if you want to have life? So here, this is supposedly our universe right, right there. And then it's blowed up, you blow it up, and then there's a little circle here that you can't see, and that's supposed to be our observable universe. So, so we have terrestrial habitable zone. HZ means habitable zone. And uh, regions of the Earth fit for life. There's temperature, water, and nutrients. Notice that they're not, uh, there are places on Earth that are not very suitable for life. And uh, so there are deserts, for example. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then we have circumstellar habitable zone. Regions of the solar system or other planetary systems fit for life, essentially wet, rocky surfaces or hydrothermal vents. Then we have galactic habitable zone. It's like this green region here. And uh, the regions of our galaxy fit for life, for example, where we have enough metals. Now, metals for an astronomer is uh, anything that's not hydrogen and helium. And we have to have a star. We have to have some time available for life to evolve. 
We have, uh, and also we don't want supernova too close, so we don't want, we need a, re a region of reduced supernova danger. And then we have the multiverse. So in this idea, here's our universe, here's our mother universe, here's our daughter universe, there's da these, uh, these uh, universes just coming into and out of existence. And there are prob presumably, if the constants of, the, of physics can change, then some of these will be uh, consistent with being habitable, and some of them are not. For example, this constant lambda, the cosmological constant, if uh, that's too big, then you have a universe that accelerates too quickly, and maybe it only lasts, uh, maybe only it can't form galaxies because it accelerates too quickly. Maybe it accelerates in the first two seconds, and then boom, it's just beyond, everything is beyond the cosmic event horizon. Or maybe baryogenesis. Baryogenesis simply means that, you know, we have an overdensity of matter. We, we think that the, there was a symmetry, almost a symmetry, between matter and antimatter. And in the first billionth of a second or so, or the first second, let's say, matter and antimatter got together, they annihilated, created all the photons that you see over there in the cosmic microwave background, but then there was some residual matter left over. And the baryon to photon ratio is about a billion to one, or rather one to a billion. And uh, so that is the leftover of how asymmetric the matter and the antimatter were in this first second during something called baryogenesis, and we don't understand why that asymmetry exists. Maybe in these other universes, there, were, there was no baryogenesis. There was no asymmetry between matter and antimatter. If that's the case, here's matter, antimatter, boom, together they come, and then they annihilate, they form photons, and then that's it. There is no matter. You cannot have stars, you cannot have planets, you cannot have life. That's the kind of universe you would have if baryogenesis, there was no asymmetry between matter and antimatter. We do not know whether that could be different or not. Since we have so little insight into this asymmetry, we have very little insight into knowing whether that baryogenesis occurred in these other universes. I should say, if you don't believe in these other universes, I think you should at least entertain the possibility. The reason is because as you get closer and closer to the Big Bang, as you can see over there on the far left of that image, over there, this image, it looks like it's singular. But if you study quantum cosmology, you know that these are fluctuations that are happening all the time, and this is one of those fluctuations. Quantum mechanics never talks about individual events. It's always statistics, statistics, statistics. So this is one of a, a very large ensemble, if you just, uh, that's what's suggested by quantum cosmology, and therefore this kind of model with multiverses is suggested. So don't just throw it out out of hand like many of my colleagues because, hey, what you see is what you get, kind of thing. Ask a quantum cosmologist if you can find one, and he will tell you about this statistical story that I just waved my hand about. Any questions about that? Just laughter. <laughs> okay. Niven, you okay with all this? Okay. All right, so I'll continue. So finding, does somebody say anything? So finding other Earths and potentially other life forms is a major, increasingly, increasingly reasonable scientific goal. So, the, so not a lot of people, not a lot of astronomers are astrobiologists, and so this is really something new, and it started as a real scientific enterprise in 1995 when the first extrasolar planet was found. So our search for habitable planets and inhabited planets is now in high gear. Notice there's a difference between habitable planets and inhabited. Inhabited means you had the origin of life, and it, life was supported. Here, it's just kind of like, here with a habitable planet, it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like, if you put life in there, and it, then it might survive. That's, so it's a big difference between inhabited and habitable. So this is a much bigger, uh, much narrower constraint. You need the origin of life, and you need to support it. All right. So. Now, a few decades ago, we knew biologists could, could talk about the terrestrial environments known to harbor life. And a few decades ago, we could talk about the extraterrestrial environments known to exist, planets. But now, in today, because biologists have looked everywhere in the hot spots and cold spots, the top of the mountains, even in the atmosphere, they go down three kilometers or 10 kilometers looking for life. And now we know that there are many, many, there are hot and cold life, there's acid, and then there's base, and there's 
uh, high pH, low pH, there's high or low salinity, dry and wet, high water activity, low water activity. These are, the, these are the parameters that biologists use, and they said, oh, I can't believe there's life over here. Oh, I can't believe there's life over here. So this is what, what's been going on for 20 years now, and so the range, the parameter space within which we think we know that life can exist on Earth has been increasing. That's why that blue oval has become much larger. Interestingly, the extraterrestrial environments known to exist have also become much larger, and so the hope is that this gets bigger, that gets bigger, there'll be habitable planets here, or even inhabited planets. Uh, I, I hesitate with the word inhabited planets because we don't know much about the origin of life. We know an awful lot about the life on Earth, and now we know an awful lot about these guys. But what we don't know, and it's still a big question, is whether life has originated on these other places, and what exactly we mean by habitable, because that's usually linked to what we know about terrestrial life, which may be very, very quirky, unique even, and other kinds of life forms may be very different. Okay, so let's look at, the, let's look at just as an example, the thing we know best is Earth. Now, on Earth, there are things called deserts. So the deserts are, here's a water desert right here, so here's a, water, here's a water desert here, here's a water desert here, 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 um, and, uh, and you, this is light brown. Then there's what I call the temperature desert, where it's too cold. So that's at the poles, obviously, the South Pole and the North Pole. Then there's something called the nitrate desert, because life needs nitrates. Where is that? That's in these middle regions here, these dark blue, dark blue, dark blue. So although you have lots of water, you have lots of sunshine, you don't have very many nitrates, and so biomass is limited by the amount of nitrate that it could get. And then you can have an iron desert down here. And these are the regions where you have iron deserts. They know it's an iron desert because you take a boat, you spray iron filings all over the place, and then boom, life comes and starts blooming everywhere. So it's limited by the amount of iron that's there, not by water, not by sunlight, not by phosphorus, but by iron. That's what these regions here are. So you can play this game for many, many things, not just water, temperature, nitrate, and iron, and life does not live by these things alone. Life is not evenly distributed on the surface of the Earth, obviously. And what about carbon? Car life needs carbon. So where is carbon available and where isn't it? Carbon usually is available in CO2, but that's going, it used to be going down, 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 down. Now we're making it go up, up because we're burning so much. But uh, carbon is not, for, so for example, if you're living one kilometer beneath the surface and there's not much contact between the CO2 at the surface and down there, then you can't live. But maybe methane is coming up and you can get the carbon from there. In any case, carbon, as CO2 or CH4, is not evenly distributed over the Earth, and so you can have carbon deserts. But pe people haven't looked at it that way very much. And how about a phosphorus desert? A lot of fertilizer, right? If you have any farmers here, you need phosphorus and nitrate. Phosphorus is needed, because why? C-H-O-S-P are the five elements, C-H-O-S-P, five elements that you need, C-H-O-N-S-P, six elements. At the 98% level, that's what you're made of. You need those elements, life needs that, and so there could be phosphor deserts. I don't know where they are because no one has made a map of them and I didn't have the resources to do it, but you could do it. But it's also a radial map, too. This is only a surface map. You, in order to talk about carbon desert, phosphorus desert or sulfur desert, you need to know not just the two-dimensional surface of the Earth, you have to go radially as well, because sometimes at certain levels it's available and sometimes it's not. And so it's a three-dimensional desert map that you need in order to talk about the uneven distribution of life near the surface of the Earth. Now, life is not evenly distributed radially. That green thing there, that's where life is. The biosphere of the Earth is a thin shell about 10 kilometers thick. And uh, so if you take a, a meter stick, then, one, then this is about uh, one millimeter. If the radius of the Earth were one meter, the thickness of the biosphere would be one millimeter. So that's about the, uh, the thinness of the, the skin of an apple. Very, very thin. And that's why it's so easy to pollute. If you have an atmosphere, it's only that thick and you're doing anything to it. It's just a very, very thin layer into which you're putting your stuff. Okay, so here's the vertical profile of life on Earth. So here is elevation. So here's zero elevation, minus 10 kilometers all the way to 10 kilometers. And here is the distribution of land. Here's the mountains 
here are the trenches, here's the seafloor, and here's where we're living right here. And uh, the point is that you can do a radial distribution or vertical distribution of, plant, of life, and you can see a lot of it is here, particularly eukaryotes like trees, plants, and fungi, but a lot of prokaryotes, these archaea and, and bacteria, are down here at about minus two, minus three, four at the seafloor, for example, or here underneath the seafloor. So that's, the, that's where life lives. And uh, so that's uh, interesting because that's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the radius of the Earth. Okay, so down here, there's no life because of a heat desert. You have a geothermal gradient. You're on average, for every kilometer you go down here, it's about 20, 15, 20 degrees. And so 20, here, by here you're getting 100 degrees. And here you're getting about 200 degrees. So life, does the limit, the maximum limit we found for life is 122 Celsius. And that is not above the boiling point because the boiling point at depth is greater than that. And if you're a mountaineer, you know that the boiling point gets, uh, goes lower. It goes to 95, and then 90, then 80. Well, it goes the opposite direction if you have higher and higher pressure underwater. And so that 122 life, it's the maximum, is at the hydrothermal vents, and that's under pressure. Okay, so we have a heat desert from here on all the way to the center. And then we have a density desert above, because then you're running out of atmosphere. You have a very exponential atmosphere. The density is getting... Less and less and less as, as you go up higher. Oh, any questions about this? Yes? What sort of depths are we looking at for the thermal vents? What sort of depths? What sort of depths? Right here. They're, the thermal vents are a little bit higher because they're at the mid oceanic ridges, and so they're about right here. So, what is that, two or three kilometers? What's the difference between prokaryotes? What's the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Prokaryotes are the bacteria that you have all over you right now, and uh, archaea. Eukaryotes are organisms like fungi, plants, and animals, and that is we have a cell, then we have a DNA inside of a nuclear membrane. Bacteria and archaea do not have that, and that's what the word carry. Carry means nucleus. Eukaryotes means you have a nucleus. You have a, you can, where the DNA is, these are before the nucleus. Uh, that's one way, it's a simple way to describe two different types of life. There are many, many eukaryotes are single cells, but all multicellular, like plants, animals, and fungi, are eukaryotes. Any other questions? Yes? What's the hypos? Hy hy <laughs> hypsometric curve. Hypsometric curve is just the radial, the, the vertical distribution of life forms. What fraction of it in this? So, where is life vertically? A lot of it is here, not much here, and then a lot of it is here. And so it just tells you the, uh, ver this is actually, this is called a hypsometric curve, right? What fraction of land, 0%, 20%, 100%, what fraction of the land area is at this depth, this depth, this depth, this depth, et cetera? That's what a hypsometric curve is. And so what we essentially did is made a hypsometric curve for life. That's a good question. I think it's by mass. By mass. Yes. Why do you know the Why, what? Life, unit of life between minus one and minus three? Because minus one. Wait, minus one is here. Minus three is here. What are you, Why isn't there much here? Well, one reason is that, look where you're here. Here we have the surface, and here we don't have that much area, surface area, but it's only about 10 or 20 percent of the Earth is between here, the whole surface, but here there's a lot. So that's one reason, because there's not that much of the surface which is at that depth, right? That, at that depth, one is from here to here, and that's only about that much, which is like 40 to 55 or something. Is that clear? Okay. Any others? Okay, moving on. So what does Earth-like mean? So I showed this slide on Saturday night. Uh, what does Earth-like mean? What are the relevant features of our Earth that made it possible for life to emerge and survive for four billion years? Well, and I said wet and rocky the other night, but let's look at that a little bit more carefully. We have, when we talk about wet and rocky Earth-like, we talk about often about half the mass of the Earth 
to about twice the Earth's mass of the Earth. We do that because we want to have about gravity, and we want the gravity to be strong enough to hold on to an atmosphere. If you're less than this, it's harder for you to hold on to an atmosphere. And if you're more than this, you start to hold on to so much atmosphere that you hold on to hydrogen and helium and you turn into a Uranus or a Neptune. So you want a wet, rocky one with, not, with an atmosphere that's not so thick that it can hold on to the hydrogen and helium, because otherwise you turn into a, a Uranus or a Neptune. Then, what else we have? Then this is the insulation. You want about half of the amount of insulation that Earth gets to about twice that. That's essentially uh, Mars to Venus in that region. You, know, you have Mars here, you have Venus here, and here's the Earth. And that whole region of well, distance from the Sun has the insulation from half to about twice the insulation that the Earth is getting. The reason for that is, well, we want to have a temperature that's kind of moderate if we're going to maintain life with water. Also, to keep an atmosphere. If you have too much insulation, that heats up the atmosphere and then makes it go away. And if you have too little insulation, well, then that atmosphere freezes out, turns into liquid, and then uh, you don't have an atmosphere anymore. It's uh, solid. It's kind of like uh, Mars. Mars has lots of water, but it's in H2O. <laughs> And, uh, and lots of CO2, and it's, it would have a much thicker atmosphere if it were warmer, and all those ice caps of CO2 and H2O would evaporate and sublimate and turn into a thicker atmosphere. How about a large moon? This is something that the Earth has. A large moon. Maybe that's necessary for tidal cycling. And what that means is about 4 billion years ago, when life got started, the moon was much, much closer. The moon has been receding. It receives at about the same speed as your fingernails grow or your hair grows, like one centimeter, a few centimeters a year. And uh, uh, it's receding, but that means four billion years ago it was very, very close. Now, tidal forces go as one on R cubed. Now, R is the, is the distance. And so when you get closer, if you get 10 times closer, you cube 10 and you get 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1,000. So the tidal heights instead of being one meter, we're a kilometer. So much, much, much higher, you can imagine, a gigantic tide because that moon was so close four billion years ago, 4.1, 4.2, 3.9. And so you had really, and this also, the day was not 24 hours, it was eight hours, maybe even five hours. So every five hours, you have this two kilometer high tide going, like, I mean, if you want to get some energy out of something, that would really would have been possible. But the whole point is that the, whatever chemistry is going on at the surface was being hydrated and dehydrated at an enormous rate, and that often can maybe provide what was necessary to produce the catalysis and the reactions that turned into life. We don't know. Okay, what about 30% continents? Well, fresh water. So about half my colleagues think that you need fresh water to have life, and you may notice that uh, the sea is salt water. And uh, you, drink salt, you drink fresh water, but you don't drink salt water. And you do that, why is that? Because the sun evaporates the, fresh, the salt water and it leaves the salt in the ocean, the fresh water goes under clouds, the clouds go over here, rains down here, fresh water, and that you can drink it. Now the question is, did the first chemistry, did our understanding of the origin of life involve fresh water or salt water? In the hydrothermal vent scenario, it was salt water. In the surface area, in the surface scenario, where you have UV photons, that was fresh water. So this is still a debate that's, well, it's very controversial. We don't know. Uh, also, three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, you get when you're at the surface. You only get two phases if you're something like on Europa, where you have rock, ocean, and then ice. If there's anything going on, it would be between the rock and the water. That water is salt water, so you'd have a hydrothermal vent scenario. If, if we can show on Earth that life evolved from a hydrothermal vent, then that's much more likely that the moons of Jupiter will be full of life. But maybe not. Maybe it requires UV photons and gas and solid and liquid all together in three phases to, to make the chemistry of life, to turn it on. Cloud cover. So here we have 30% cloud cover. You notice you look at this... You see about 30% of the surface of the Earth at any one time is covered with clouds. I don't know why that is. I've asked many people, why is it 30%? Why not 50%? Why not 2%? Why not 0%? Why not 100%? And very, <laughs> I, I don't get good answers from anybody I've asked. Uh, but maybe it's important, because maybe it controls the albedo. Notice that when it's white like this, 
the sun shines on white and most of it gets reflected. The albedo is very high. Water, you can see this is pretty dark. The water is dark and so it has a low albedo. It absorbs a lot of sunlight. So how much of the surface of a planet that's covered with clouds versus how much is water really determines how much of the sunlight it comes to that planet. And that's important, maybe, for the photons, for this energy that required for the origin of life. Then high mass star. Now you notice, I don't know how many of you guys give lectures to the public, but as I was growing up, I heard the sun is a normal star. That is wrong. If you compare, now, if you do a survey of the closest, let's say, 100 stars, maybe 200 stars, the region, of, the only region of the universe where we have a very, very good estimate of how many there are, why? Because a lot of stars are M dwarfs, they're low luminosity, they're hard to see, and uh, matter of fact, the closest star to the sun you can't even see with your eyes, right? Proxima Centauri, I can look in that direction all night, I'm trying to see if it's over on, there's the cross, I'm trying to see if it's there, but anyway, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the sun, you can't see with your eyes, why? Because it's so dim. That's the kind of selection effect associated. That's why it's very important if you want to see how does the sun compare to all stars, you do a survey of the nearest, let's say 200, 300 stars, and then you can see, what do you see? That the sun is more massive than about 95%. The sun is a very, very massive star compared to all stars. Now, it's a normal star if you compare it to the stars in the sky that you see. Why? Because you can't see any of the dim ones. So then you're comparing it to all the bright ones, and oh, the sun is about a normal one. So keep that, that, keep that in mind, and uh, because that might be important that the sun is, we're not, we, the Earth is not orbiting an Emsdorf. It's orbiting a star that's more massive than 95% of all stars. Maybe that's because when you're a massive star, you give off a lot more UV radiation. And UV radiation, you know, it's not only damaging to your skin, it's also very energetic and can energize electrons, take an electron, pop it up here, and then, oh, it's all ready to do something. And then it could create some kind of reactions that we don't know that much about, but it, it might be important. And uh, the 95%, the sun being 95%, more massive than 95%, might be a clue to UV radiation possibly being important for the origin of life. I'm waving my hands. Question. An M dwarf is a one of the low, it's about, uh, we have a bunch of astronomers here, so I would say it's about uh, half the mass of the sun down to about 8% of the mass of the sun. Does anybody want to, somebody should know that better than I do. Bill, do you know? <laughs> anyway, these are, now, so there's M, there's O, B, A, and F, G, K, M. So O, B stars are the most massive ones, and K, M stars are less, less, less massive. G stars are about, I don't know, 0.9 to 1.1 solar masses. Then there are K stars from about 0.9 to about 0.5. And then 0.5 to, 8 to 0.08 is our M dwarfs. Beneath that are brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are between 13 and 70 Jupiter masses. They can burn deuterium for a little bit, but deuterium is like 10 to the minus 4 of the hydrogen. So there's not much deuterium to burn, but it, is, it can be burned by brown dwarfs, but then they run out of it and then they're, not, they're, they're no longer stars. So you have brown dwarfs, and you have M dwarfs, then Ks, then uh, Gs, like sun. Any other, uh, yes? Yeah, so um, how, how much, what's the abundance of a G2B main sequence star, such as our star in Alpha Centauri A? What's, what's the abundance of G2 stars? Yeah. Well, I, like you said, uh, Alpha Centauri A and B are like 1.1 like solar masses and 0.9. So I, I'm not sure if they're G2, maybe they're G1 or G3. I, do you know? I know, I, the thing I know about Alpha Centauri A is a G2. Is that right? Okay, so ours is a G2 but, as well. But it's not Alpha Centauri A. Right, so that would be 0.9, maybe it's a K. So, so if it's not a G star, it would be a K star because Alpha Centauri B is less massive. Yeah, it was a K, yeah. Um, so what do you think is about this? Like how many percent of the universe are made of G2 B stars? Well, so let's say here's the main sequence. It goes from M dwarfs all the way to OB stars, right? And so what you're asking is a question. We have O, B, F, F, A, G, K, M. And what you're asking is what fraction of this, all these stars is this big? Now, the reason I can't answer your question is I don't know whether G2s are this big or this big. 
So G's might be this big, G2 might be this big, right? So I don't know. I would say it's, now when I said that the sun was more massive than 95% of stars, what I'm saying is from here to here are 95% of the stars, from here to here are 5%. And now you're asking me how many are here, and uh, I, well, let me guess, uh, 1%. <laughs> okay. That's the best I can do. Yes, question. Uh, how do you measure, how would you measure the insulation of other planets besides Earth? Okay, so you see a star, you look at its spectrum, and you know how bright it is. Now it can be, if it's far away, but you see the spectrum, you can say, oh, although it's far away, I know it's a very, very bright star. Why? Because of a spectrum, it's blue spectrum, right? So it, its apparent brightness is not very high, but its absolute brightness is uh, derivable from its spectrum. You okay with that so far? Okay. The next thing is, how far away is the planet from the star? Well, you get the period. We use Kepler's law. If you know what the period is, and that's what we get from radial velocity techniques or transits, like transit, 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 it's got a two second period, this planet. Every two seconds goes around, right? So then you plug in two seconds into Kepler and it tells you the semi-major axis. That tells you the one over r squared to figure out how much of that luminosity from the star gets to that planet. That's how you determine the insulation or effective temperature on a exoplanet. You not happy with that? Not quite there. So then, I, I suppose, like if you were talking about a, a planet with an hour in the solar system, you think about, I'm more thinking about how, is there a way to figure out how much of that heat it holds on to? Oh, well, that's albedo. That's albedo. So if it's a pure white thing, then its albedo is one and hard, it just reflects almost everything. If it's more like uh, this thing, Earth's albedo is about 0.3. So 30% of the impinging sunlight is absorbed and 70% is reflected. Does the um, composition of the planet's atmosphere affect that much? Yes, yes. For example, Venus is a very, is a clouds in the upper atmosphere and its albedo is something like 0.9 or something. And there's some moons that are very, well, I guess the darkest carbonaceous chondrites have an albedo of, I don't know, 0.1 or something. So it's really dark, absorbs all kinds of things. And the things with high white clouds have a very high albedo, 0.9 or so. And the Earth is 0.3. Now, if the Earth had lots, if the Earth was just covered with clouds, then, then the albedo would be, I don't know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, like Venus. The Venus albedo is really high, but it still is really hot. Yes, that's because the atmosphere is so thick. Yeah. So it, it lets through only 10%, but with that 10%, it, it holds on to them. Uh, it holds on to the energy there. It's got the greenhouse effect going crazily, because you have 90 bars. So the difference between the albedo and the insulating properties of the atmosphere, is there a way that we can tell that from exoplanets? Well, you could make guesses about what the atmosphere is made of. And then, for example, if it's made out of methane, it's made out of water vapor, it's made out of oxygen. Each of these gases has different greenhouse abilities. And if you can guess, okay, the temperature range here and the pressure is this, therefore the atmosphere must be bleh. And then you make a guess, and then that tells you how much of that, how, how you then can convert from an albedo and the, uh, magnet, the distance to the, from the exoplanet to the host star, how much that heat gets down, and then how much is kept. So that's the game we play. It's not, we cannot really, talk about the albedo of exoplanets yet. So we just assume for some things, hey, all the planets are 0.3, just like the Earth. We just assume they're the same as the Earth, even though we know that there's a wide distribution. Okay, all right, moving along. So circumstellar habitable zone, here's a circumstellar habitable zone on a beach. Here's the central star, and here are all the planets, and this planet was too cold, it's got a little bit warmer, and then in about two minutes that planet's gonna say, hey, it's too hot here, I'm gonna move back here. And so that's the habitable zone around that fire. And that's, because that, these are bags of water, right? These are bags of water, and they wanna stay water. If they get close, they'll turn into steam, and if they go too far away, then they turn into ice. And you don't want that to happen if you're a life form. Okay, so here's a central star, and here it's too hot, here it's just right, and here it's too cold. And we wrote a paper about seven, six years ago. The average number of planets in the habitable zones of stars is about two. Okay, now to give you a, the, the habitable zone of a star depends on how big that star is. So here's Sirius A is a big star, I think. I'm not sure, is this a, is this a, 
Who can tell me? Is this a B star? I don't know what series that is. I think it is a type A. Is it type A? Okay, it's type A. Here's type A, and here's a G. Here's a it's alpha sen. And here's the size of the, this donut here is the size of this uh, habitable zone between about half and twice the insulation that the Earth has. That's essentially between Venus and Mars insulation. And so this, this habitable zone of the Earth is somewhere in here. And in here is Proxima. And you can see, you can't see that donut very well, but that's to show you how close and how tiny the habitable zones are around the low mass stars. They're really, really close. And so you have a, an 11 day period. Here we have 365 days to be in the habitable zone that the Earth is. And here, dim star, you gotta get very close, you have an 11 day period to be in the habitable zone. And a lot of the new exoplanets that are found are around these M dwarfs because, why? Because you go around and around and around and around. You look for, I don't know, you look for a month and you see it go around three times. You know, if you look for a month at the Earth, you see around, don't even see it go around. Right? You want to see multiple transits. Or, and uh, Anyway, it's very easy to detect planets when they're going around like that, and much harder if they're going like that. Okay, one other thing, interesting thing about the habitable zone is that when stars, as they burn their hydrogen into helium, the helium ash goes in the middle, and then stars get brighter. The sun in the last four billion years has gotten about 30% brighter. What that means is that the habitable zone recedes because the sun is getting brighter. And that's what this shows. Here we go, here's the age of the sun in billions of years. Here we are today. The habitable zone goes like this. And then as the sun gets hotter, the habitable zone gets further and further away. Notice that Mars will enter the habitable zone right about here in about a billion and a half. And Venus already is outside the habitable zone and will get further and further out. And the Earth will leave the habitable zone right about here in about, I don't know, a few billion years. And so, uh, I don't know, get your safety equipment. <laughs> now, uh, people who've done calculations uh, to figure out how long the Earth will remain habitable sometimes throw out the number like a billion years because as the sun gets brighter and brighter, it gets harder and harder to hold on to the water. When all the water is gone from the surface, then you can't have life very easily. And so you, we have another billion years, but you're only gonna live for another 50 or 100. So you don't need to worry about that. Even your grandchildren will be dead before this time comes. But if you're a cosmologist, you think about such things. Okay, what about the chemical habitable zone? Here's an interesting thing. So here is the, the solar abundances of these elements, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon. These, by the way, is the in order of the abundance of the elements. And uh, here, the sun is one. It's normalized to the abundance of these elements in the sun. That's what this gray band is. And here are a bunch of stars that are nearby, nearby stars. And you can see that some have half the abundance of these elements, and some have twice the abundance. But, you know, you, you remember that the sun is about one or two, well, it's about 1.4% non-hydrogen helium. And so that, this one's twice, that's the 3.8% non-hydrogen helium. And here's half, so it's about one or 0.9% or 0.7% non-hydrogen helium, and so that's the degree to which the elemental abundances vary. And uh, we're trying to play a game about figuring out, are there, is there anything particular about the relative abundances of these elements that is needed for the recipe of life? And we don't know, but we can compare the elemental abundances of the sun to other stars. And for example, if we talk about the C to O ratio, it's very important. If the C to O ratio, the C to O ratio of the sun is about a half, and if it were about 0.8, then instead of being a silicate planet, we would have a diamond planet, carbide planet. Why is that? Well, hydrogen and helium, that's what a star is made out of. The Earth is made out of these things here, mostly these two, and these are really, really important. Now, if you have twice as much oxygen as you have carbon, then, Carbon and oxygen will come together, form CO, and get blown out of the system. Most of the carbon just disappears because as CO. That leaves a whole truckload of oxygen. And then that oxygen is free to combine with the nitrogen, magnesium, not with the nitrogen, but the magnesium, silicon, oxygen. And this is what the Earth is made of. Oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and iron. That's what the rock is. Anytime a rock, this is what you're looking at. 
oxygen plus these guys. And the reason for that is because the C to O ratio of the sun was about one half of this and one of these. And all, almost all the carbon came together with the oxygen, got blown away, and that's why there's so tiny, tiny amount of carbon on this planet, which is so important to life. Life controls the carbon cycle on this planet. There's very little carbon compared to the carbon in the sun. And so sometimes we say, what's the CO ratio of that star? If it's higher than 0.8, then we say, no silicates, it's gonna be a carbide planet. What does that mean for life? <clears throat> we have no idea. Carbide life, I don't know what that means. Yes? Um, so obviously these gaps, uh, so you know, these silicon, iron, sodium, nickel, and titanium, um, are the gaps where there aren't data, is that because there aren't there been any surveys of the stars? That, that's because, because the data that we used, when astronomers measure stars, they say, okay, how many elements am I, go, am I gonna go for? And in this one, they went for, I don't know, one, two, three, four, actually most of them have five, right? One, two, three, four, five. There are only five elements uh, for all these stars. So you're right that <laughs> this is for silicon, this is for iron, but notice sulfur doesn't even show up here. So what, this is an old diagram, and if I made it again, there would be many more there because people are really filling in this diagram. But I haven't seen a, an updated version, so there you go. So chemical habitable zone. Again, we don't know what that means. So here's in, something interesting. This is a paper we wrote a couple of years ago, and this is interesting. The, sol, the solar abundances are up here in yellow. So the solar abundances, and the x-axis here is the condensation temperature of the elements. Essentially, how hot, if you have it really, really hot, how cool do you get it? When does it condense? When does it go from a gas to a solid or a liquid? That's the condensation temperature. And if you are really refractory, you're over here, you're aluminum and calcium and zircon and osmium and rhenium. And if you're really volatile, then you're over here, tellurium, indium, bromium, and the noble gases are way over here. So this is essential, and what, what is this showing? This is showing that here are the abundances of the sun in the yellow, and here the, the abundances of the earth are the same, <laughs> Jeez. they're the same for this horizontal line, but then as you get to these other more volatile elements, they get depleted, 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 depleted. And so the sun, I mean, sorry, the earth is a devolatilized piece of the sun. So you take this much of the sun, get rid of the hydrogen and helium, blow it away, and then you get rid of these other volatile elements, blow them away to some extent, and then you have the earth. So any rocky planet will be a, a devolatilized piece of its host star. That's why the measurement of the abundances of elements in these other stars, which you can get from the spectra, is so important to figure out what the planets around that star are going to be. Up until this work, people were saying, oh, the abundance of the planets are going to be with the abundance of the star. And this work says, no, 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 that's only the case for elements from here to here. That's only the case for hafnium and aluminum and zirconium and calcium, but not for these other ones. This is depleted by a factor of 10. Here's depleted by a factor of 100 and more. Okay. So, to show you how much progress we're making, here's a pot. Here is period, the orbital period, and here's the mass of the planet in units of Jupiter masses. So here's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. That's where our planetary system is. In 2012, based on these different techniques, we had that many exoplanets. And then, 2015, we had this many. This is mostly Kepler going with the uh, transit technique. But notice also that there are some imaging, direct imaging up here, that's here, and there's also some microlensing here, 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 microlensing, and then there are some pulsar timings, that's right here. And uh, anyway, this is their very diff different techniques to detect these planets, they're all over the place, this is period versus mass, and I wanna show you, this is a new plot that we just made like last week, so this is, we have lots and lots of planets here. This is some, the newest data. We have the mass of the planet we get from the Doppler method. That's the radial velocity one. And the transit technique gives us the radius. 
when a planet passes in front of a star, it dims, it dims by a, an amount proportional to the radius of the planet, r squared, the area of it. So that transit technique gives you the radius. This uh, technique, Doppler technique, or the radial velocity gives you the mass. And so then we have a whole bunch of stuff that we can plot on this diagram. And why that's cool is because then we can talk about the density. Right? Because if you have both the mass and the radius, you have the density. So here are all the things that have the density of iron on this red line. The green line is all the things that have the density of Earth. And the purple line here, magenta, is all the things that have the density of water. And you can, now I should point out, here's Mercury, it's almost got a lot of iron, and here's Mars. There's Venus and the Earth. And Venus and the Earth and Mars are all pretty close to that blue line, the, the, this uh, Earth line. And some of these objects here, the ones that are further out, they're more like water. They have a higher water content. Here are the ones that are closer in and smaller. They're more like they're rocks. Those are all in our solar system. But what we're interested in is the ones that are here. These are exoplanets. Here are hot Jupiters. You can see that they're hot because they're red. Over here is the temperature, the effective temperature. They're 1,500 degrees at their surface. And that's, these are hot Jupiters. Jupiter is right there, and Saturn is right there. So these are cold hydrogen. Then we have this water, and then we have Earth, and then we have iron. So it's a lovely plot. Anybody have questions about this latest plot? We have lots of new data. This is growth. Yes, question. My question about because a lot of people talk about water, and we've got this place where water is on Earth, and that, that, that zone that you talked about, but where we can have water. Water is a rocky planet, planet, but only 10 to the minus 4 percent of the mass of the Earth is water. So yeah. water is, Earth is not water. Water. are taking the wet rock and planets based on the, their position in this habitable zone. Yeah, if we see a, stu uh, we see a, a stu I'll show you a blow up of this square in the next slide. But if you see an exoplanet that's here, that means it has, it's rocky and has the, comp the density of the Earth. If it's here, it has the density of iron. If it's here, it has the density of water. Okay. I'm thinking when you're talking about the water so much, about how maybe overestimating potentially rocky wet planets by thinking about Earth in terms of it can keep the water. But is it, is it, could it be lucky that it has the water, for example? Um, because things like the heavy lake bombardment have delivered it in a bit of yeah. a random way. Yeah. And if we look out there and assume that that could happen there, it may be that we're lucky. Rather than right. Well, we don't know the answer to that question. However, there's some, one thing is that during the formation of planets, there will inevitably be some kind of um, radial mixing. And that means if here's the star and here's this protoplanetary disk, Objects are going to be moving around, blah, 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 and they're going to be banging into each other. And you're right to ask whether this is just lucky that we have the water, because Earth is in a region that should be bone dry, but it has 10 to the minus 4 water. Where did that come from? Where did the water on Earth come from? And it's interesting, my Earth scientist colleagues think it's endogenous. That means it was kept there, and it just comes out when you have volcanoes. I think that's crazy, mostly because I'm an astronomer, because the Earth probably formed from boom, 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 boom. Every time you, and plus, these are things that are very close to the sun. They do not have a lot of water in them. And then if they go boom, which they inevitably did during accretion, they then get rid of the water and they heat things up and then it goes away. So the idea of having endogenous water, I think, is, is, doesn't hold water <laughs> to me. And, uh, but if you talk to an Earth scientist, I guarantee you say, oh, we don't know, maybe it's endogenous. And the reason they say that is because they see water coming out of volcanoes all the time, and they associate that with the big Earth. And they don't like to think of, wait a minute, the Earth was a result of accretion, 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 accretion. And that accretionary process not only was from dry rocks, but if, even if they had some water, that would be dried out, dehydrated during the collision, which is so energetic and heats them up. So. Uh, I, but, so, so if the water then is from this radial mixing, it is the case that the largest objects, if they are watery, have brought most of the water to Earth. So if there was one impact that brought 50% of the water, if that didn't happen, then we'd have 50% less water. Um, and we don't have that much water anyway. But whatever amount of water we have will be at the surface. Why? Because it's lighter than rock. Just for the same reason that atmosphere is over above, then comes the water, and then comes a the rock, and then comes even denser rock, and the iron is in the middle. That's a density gradient that's universal. And so 
Uh, even if we, I mean, let's suppose that we got rid of half the water on Earth. Would that change that much? It wouldn't change that much for you and me, but uh, I, I don't know what it would change, actually. I, I, uh, yes? Uh, no, keep um, asking. I, looking further down towards the list of the chart, is, I'm assuming those are the names of the solar system moons. They're moons and asteroids, something like Vesta is here, for example. So those ones that are on the purple line. Well, those ones that are on the... On the purple line, on the, the water line. Do they, I, I don't know... If you these are ones that are further out in the solar system that have more water in them. If you look at the asteroid belt from about, let's say about 2 AU to about 3.5 AU, the water content increases as you go from 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5. And that's simply because you're further away from the sun, you, it's easier for you to hold on to the, the ice. Comets that are further out have more water content, but if they come around close to the sun, then they lose it. That's why comets are comets, right? They lose the dust and the water as they come in every time. They lose the volatiles. And so even, those, even the ones that are maybe closer to with Pluto, is they have, I'm assuming they're more icy? Pluto, yeah, it's icy. It's, it's halfway between rocky Earth and water. I mean the, the moons. The moons. Titan, where, there's our moon here. There's the moon of, where's Charon? Charon is right there. So it's got lots of ice on it. Okay, anyway, those are the, the objects in our solar system. And for the next slide, I'm gonna show you the planets that we're interested in. Oh, by the way, we're getting, this blow up is between half to 20 times the mass of the Earth and one to four times the radius of the Earth. That's that little square. So here it is. So mass goes from about 10 to the zero is one, so it's about half the mass of the Earth to about 20 times the mass of the Earth, and then from about one times the radius of the Earth to about 3.5 times. That's a blow up of that, so let me go back and show, so it's a blow up of that thing, and the reason why that's important is because here's Venus and here's Earth on this, this line here, so, and then we're gonna look at all these other new ones. And when you do that, you get this. Plus, this color is the insulation relative to the Earth. How, now the Earth is one on this slide. So anything that's down here is 30%, is 30 times more insulated than the Earth. The reason for that is because of the tremendous bias in finding these things that they do not have one year orbits, they have 10 day, 20 day, 30 day orbits because those are the ones that are easy to find. In any case, what we look, when we look at this, we say, hey, look at this. We have very much of an over density here and we're gonna call these Earths. But over here, it's a continuation of the same composition, Earth-like composition, but look at all their, it turns red here. Why did it turn red? It turns red because they're really, really hot. So here are very massive things that if they held on to their water and they could have, but they were so in, had so much insulation that they lost their water, and so they end up here made out of iron and silicates, just like the Earth. And that's what this over-density is. And we call these hot, super earths. And then you have an over density here in blue where you're pretty much uh, water. You have, you have iron and rock, but you also have lots and lots of water. And then uh, in these guys here, and you notice that they're not as hot on average as these guys here. So we've divided this plot into the green, the red, and the blue. The water worlds, the hot super earths, and earths. And that's the type of compositional information you can start to squeeze out of the exoplanet data when you have hundreds or even thousands of data points. And this is new science. This is something we haven't been able to do up until the last few months. And every, every month or so, we get 10 more, 20 more, 30 more because of planet, uh, satellites like TESS. Okay, so here's another, uh, how, how much, how am I doing for time? What time did I start? And how much time do I have left? I can't go on as What do you think, Bill? Um, I didn't have a watch. Three minutes past nine, Bill. Oh, okay. So you would better make it fairly quick, but um, okay. we'll go for an hour and we'll be going an hour. But I think you'll I'll finish off what you wanted to do. Anyway. Okay. I'll, all right. So uh, I'll try to be quick. Actually, there's lots more slides, so I'm a little embarrassed. But anyway. This is, this is an important slide here. This is the escape velocity of a planet. And over here is the insulation, how much sunshine is good, or starshine is on the surface. And here is called, this is called the cosmic shoreline plot. And uh, 
And you can see everything here is just atmosphere. Everything here are rocky planets without atmospheres. And everything here is where you have rocks with atmospheres. And so that's another way to analyze these new data sets uh, and to figure out what type of atmosphere they have. So I'm going to skip that and go on. Here's another diagram. Here's the planetary radii. And here is the number of planets in each radius bin. And you can see there are a lot here. And this, again, the temperature, these are the hot big ones. They're easy to detect. Here they're hot because they're close to their stars and they go around very rapidly and so they're easy to detect and that's why they're more hot than the average. Here are the average ones. You can see that this bias starts to come in here and uh, so we have biases here and biases here and we can trust this in the middle up to about here. Some people, I think that this is just going to go zoom up here and we just, the reason it goes down is because they're hard to detect. Uh, okay, I want to probably skip over some of this. I just talk about this slide for a second. There are three panels here. The up here is the accretion rate. So this is the accretion rate tons per million years. And this is in the early part, this is a starting at T0, the formation of the sun. The Earth was forming and you had a gigantic bombardment rate for the first hundred million years or so, and then it gradually went down, and that's it's red because oh it's dangerous, so many impacts that you can't have life. And then it calmed down, and so you have clement conditions up at the top. And here's the Earth today with a bombardment rate that's relatively low compared to the gigantic one it had early on. Now here's the distance from the sun, and because you know that the sun is getting hot, the circumstellar habitable zone is going up, 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 and it's, the Earth is going to leave. But the whole point here is the mean surface temperature. And what we're proposing here is that it's easy to have a runaway greenhouse, and it's easy to have a runaway ice albedo. These are positive feedbacks that take you out of comfort zone. And that's, our paper analyzed that. And what we're saying is, most planets either go runaway greenhouse, like Venus, or runaway ice albedo, like Mars, and it's very hard to stay inside this regime, and life plays an active role in keeping it that way. Just like right now, your body temperature is a 37. You have a negative feedback, and if it gets too hot, your body says, hey, cool it down. And you, if it gets too cool, it says, heat it up. You do that for pH, you do that for water activity, you do that for all kinds of things right now, and you don't even know it. The whole idea is that maybe the biosphere does that. This is James Lovelock's idea. And so maybe it's very hard to regulate the planet when you have these runaway greenhouse and runaway ice house in the very beginning when you have so many things bombarding it. But luckily you come through or luckily you figure out how to do that. And uh, for example, you figure out how to control the atmosphere to have this greenhouse gas rather than that one because this greenhouse gas is more of a greenhouse gas than this one or less of a greenhouse gas because the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are controlled by the life at the surface. That's what life controls. It doesn't control anything beneath 20 kilometers and to the center, nothing. That's convection, that's nothing that life does. Everything you do, like right now, we got a whole room full of people breathing CO2. Why is that there? Because the plants made so much oxygen that something had to evolve to breathe that oxygen so it would go around and create CO2 for the plants and it just goes around and around and around. That's what life does. And when it does that, if it has a negative feedback, it can stay within this regime, and so we call that the Gaian bottleneck. For all planets that learn how to regulate themselves, that's just like the way you're regulating your temperature, those are the ones that are successful and can maintain life. And if you don't do that, then you go Venusy or go Marsy. And maybe these are universal ideas, and so that's what that paper was about. And I'm wondering what else I should say. Here's some negative and positive feedback. I don't have time to go about that. Uh, so here's a planet. Here's a planet right here. This is the horse. And the rider is life. And then most of the time what happens is that the, the planet is so unstable. There's this green, these impacts and it's hard to control. And then you fall off and then you die. And so you don't have life anymore because even if you got started, you didn't control the atmosphere well enough and then you go extinct. Uh, there's a diagram showing that. But as we more learn more and think about the habitable zone, we realize the biggest uncertainty is not clouds, it is life itself. What does life do? What can life do? How far can selection go?
to produce life forms that can control their environment very early on, when that environment hasn't gone runaway or lost its water. Cars don't stay on the road without drivers. Similarly, planets may not stay habitable without life. And the guy in bottleneck is also a new candidate solution to the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? Everybody's falling off their horse. And we're the lucky ones. So I'll stop there and ask for questions. <clears throat> Now, I, I didn't have time to talk about the galactic habitable zone or the universe habitable zone, but if you ask a question about it, I'm willing to. You have a thank you slide. Oh, I do, yeah. yeah get, it, get to it. Oh, my wife wanted me here's a galactic, here's a galactic habitable, oh, here's the, the ensemble of universes, and then here's a thank you to <laughs> So, uh, Auckland Astronomical Society, thank you very much, and I appreciate being down here, and uh, I was happy to talk to you guys and answer your questions. And here I am looking for exoplanets, I guess. <laughs> and I didn't have any of those binoculars before. So it was really, really a nice thing to get. Yes. And thank you. I'm saying thank you for it. <laughs> All right. So is it time for any questions? or? Yeah, you have So, so uh, I read that Pluto uh, has an extraordinary amount of heat coming out of it that was unexpected. And I think, I think all the gas giants are warmer than so. Why would that be? Is there any theory? Of well, that, the amount of heat that comes out of the planet, well, you know, um, I'll, there are two sources of heat. One is, in the very beginning, when a planet forms, it goes, it accretes. And the accretion energy is really a lot of it. And the question is, how much of that accretion energy is still around? Number two. When everything that I know of is hotter in the center than it is at the surface. The moon is hotter in the center. The earth is hotter in the center. Matter of fact, here's a cool fact. The earth, the temperature at the center of the earth is the same as the surface temperature of the sun. I'm not sure if that means anything, but it's an interesting fact. But anytime you have something that accretes gravitationally, you're going to have a lot of heat. Now, that heat can be lost, right? And, uh, but, so that's one, accretionary heat. The other source of heat is radioactivity. Right? So how much there you're producing depends on how much of the radioactive elements you have. There are four radioactive elements. There's thorium, uranium-235, 238, and I think, uh, is it calcium-40? Or, or, anybody know? Anyway, there are four. these are radioactive isotopes which produce heat. Now, if you're big, then you, it's kind of like an elephant. It's, it's easy for an elephant to hold its heat. Why? Because it's, it doesn't have that much surface area compared to its volume. But if you're really small, then you have... Uh, more surface area, and you can lose your heat. That's why Mars, we talked about this on Saturday, Mars cooled off faster than the Earth did. Why? Because it's smaller. And even if it had the same amount of radioactive elements, it's t it, it loses its heat more easily. It's like a mouse cools off. That's why mice have to eat more than an elephant does per unit of itself. Um, so the question is, so there are two sources of heat, accretionary heat and uh, radioactivity, and one more is tidal heating. If you're very close to a star, if you're very close to a planet, like Io, for example, Io is going because of its accretion, because of its tidal heating from, the, uh, from going around Jupiter. Now, that is the case if you, particularly if you have a centric orbit. So if you're going zoom, zoom, like that. If you have a circular orbit, there's, there's less tidal heating. So those are the three sources. And what was the question? That, that was it. Okay. Well, just, so, it's, right, so. Oh, so you asked, you asked about uh, heating. So there's something called the Urey ratio. If you're interested in this Earth, you can say how much, radio, how much heat is in the Earth and how much is coming out versus how much is being produced, and we don't, we don't understand it. You look at the Urey ratio problem, and I think the, something like only a third as much heat as we expect is coming out of the Earth, and we don't know why. It's called the Urey ratio problem. So we don't know why it's going to go on. That's right. That's, we, the, what's going on in the cent interiors of planets is very hard to know. How much of these radioactive elements they have is hard to know because they've been depleted to some extent. But that's not something I'm an expert in. So it's, and when I talk to my colleagues about that issue, I haven't gotten very good answers. So it's a large uncertainty there. Even about the Earth. Yeah. Um, you and we talk a lot about the habitable zone, um, but there's quite a strong likelihood of life being on 
moons of the planets which are well it's not happening for example their local conditions mean there's yep. the same sort of agreements. Yes. Um, is that a flaw in our it might be or it might not. And it really depends on which of the scenarios for the origin of life is most common. Maybe life can form in the, in the bottom of the ocean of Europa, at the rocks that have these hydrothermal vents going on in the salt water here. Maybe that's all you need for the origin of life. We know that that's all you need for the main maintenance of life, but maybe, this is a really important issue, we should look at the bottom of the phylogenetic tree of life and try to identify, is that the earliest life forms, are, is their metabolism, the genes that they have, the oldest genes we can find that is everywhere in the tree of life, are they consistent with being at a hydrothermal vent, which is hotter, which is like 200, are they hyperthermophiles, or are they at the surface where you're not hyperthermophilic? So that's the type of questions people who are doing phylogenies are asking themselves to try to figure out whether life started at a hydrothermal vent. If it did, then your suggestion that there could be life in all these moons deep beneath the ice at the rock water interface, that's perfectly legitimate because why? Because we have good confidence that life started on Earth that way. But if on the other hand, we say we need fresh water, we need UV photons, then forget about those moons. That's the type of, that's still a controversy we don't know. We have the, but that's definitely trying to be resolved by people working in the field. Any more questions? Or maybe we should um, kind of shut up. Thanks very much. That's Charlie. I've got a little word. I'm a little different. Oh. Actually, because my school has <laughs> something that um, will be of a bit to a museum of it, actually. So, oh. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.